Hi guys, Olive here, here today to bring you my very last video of 2017. In my opinion, this is one of the most exciting videos of the year. In this video, I would like to tell you about the top 10 fiction books that I read during 2017. I will give the usual disclaimers that these are simply the books that I read during the calendar year of 2017. They weren't necessarily published during 2017. And these books are ranked from number 10 to number one. So you will see my very favorite fiction book of the year at the very end of the video. And the number 10 spot is The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. This was a book on my 2017 Classics TBR. And the story follows siblings Tom and Maggie Tulliver, whose family abruptly loses their mill and all of their possessions after their father loses a lawsuit against his arch nemesis. As the siblings enter adulthood, they begin to handle this loss and their dedication to the family legacy in their very own disparate way, since they are at their cores very different people. I was immediately drawn in by George Eliot's writing and the wit with which she tells this story. While I wasn't the biggest fan of the ending, this story in general has really stuck with me and it has made me very excited to read other books of hers in the near future. My ninth favorite book of 2017 was The Night Watch by Sarah Waters. As is true of all of Sarah Waters' novels, this is a work of historical fiction, but it is not her typical novel in that it is not set during the Victorian era, but rather takes place both during and immediately following World War II. The novel is divided into three different sections and we begin to move backward in time in each section. So the first section is 1940 where we are introduced to the characters, then we go backward to 1944, and then again backward to 1941. During these backward movements in time, we begin to see not only how all these characters interconnect, but also we see how much or how little has changed for them since the war ended. Sarah Waters never fails to blow me away. She always manages to craft a really tight story, but where she truly excels is creating these flesh and blood characters and settings that feel so real and tangible that you want to wrap them around you like a cozy sweater. I am legitimately really upset that I only have two books of hers left to read. Dear Sarah Waters, Please publish more books. Love, Olive. Coming in at number eight is Sweet Bitter by Stephanie Dandler. This is a fairly recently released piece of literary fiction that I read at the very beginning of 2017. This book takes place in the fine dining restaurant culture of New York City. Small town girl Tess decides to move to New York for all the reasons that one does so and gets seriously lucky in landing a job at a very famous fine dining restaurant. The pay may be good, but the learning curve is steep and Tess finds herself getting an education in wine, in restaurant culture, meaning how hard restaurant staff tend to party after hours. But she is also desperate to learn more about Jake, a bartender at this restaurant who she has the hots for, but who also has a complicated sibling-like relationship with an older waitress at this restaurant, Simone who takes Tess under her wing and acts as her mentor. Though this book certainly has a moderately pretentious air, I loved how vividly the restaurant and its atmosphere leapt off the page. It is a book that has really stuck with me, and every time I think about it, I really want a good glass of wine. My seventh favorite book of the year is The Strays by Emily Bitto. This book was one of the random books off of my TBR, and it follows a very young girl named Lily, who was very close to her best friend, Eva. As the two progress through childhood together, Lily becomes more and more a part of Eva's family, who have an unorthodox living situation. Eva's parents are both artists who come from wealthy families, and they invite other artists who are not in their financial position to come and live with them so as to be unburdened by life struggles and any kind of money problems, so as to be able to focus all of their energy on their art. Though this is well-intentioned, it leads to major problems in just about every single relationship in this very complicated web of people. I thought this book was very simple in its elegance, and it reminded me a lot of The Interestings by Meg Wallitzer, which is a favorite book of mine. I also thought the book asked some really interesting questions, such as how much are we really responsible for when we have made life-altering decisions as children? In the number six spot is Tuesday Nights in 1980 by Molly Prentice. We start off this book on New Year's Eve 1979, looking forward into the decade of the 80s. The majority of the characters in this novel are in some way connected to the art scene in New York City. Particularly, we follow a very talented painter originally from Argentina, and we also follow an art critic whose talent for writing about art stems from his very extreme case of synesthesia. In this book, we see how loss and tragedy 
irrevocably changes these characters' lives, but how love and art and the deep connection between those two things can help them string things back together. Never before have I ever had such a physical reaction to reading a book. The descriptions of the art critic's synesthesia and how he experiences the world were so vivid and alive in my mind that I would be getting tingling sensations in my head and need to take regular breaks. I don't know why, as a non-artist, I seem to connect to books on art so much, but this was definitely one that I enjoyed in a big way. In the number five spot is Longborn by Joe Baker. This book was my first five-star read of the year, and in it we follow the servants working at Longborn, which is the Bennett family's home in Pride and Prejudice. We learn all about the household staff, both old and new, and about the goings-on in their lives during the same period of time where the events of Pride and Prejudice are taking place. As such, we do see some of the events of Jane Austen's classic unfold, but we only see as much as would make sense for a servant to have seen. These familiar plot points do not dominate the novel, since the focus is firmly on the servants' lives, their social lives, their inner worlds, everything about them. It was really fun to see a different side to the characters of Pride and Prejudice, especially since it is a favorite of mine. But the story of the servants is so strong and so lovely to read that it easily could stand on its own. My fourth favorite book of the year is The Glorious Heresies by Lisa McInerney. This is a gritty tale showcasing an interconnected cast of characters, can you tell that's in my wheelhouse, in the Irish city of Cork. In the first scene of this novel, a crime is committed, accidentally, but that doesn't matter much. And as the book goes on, you begin to see the ripple effect that this crime has on every single character you go on to meet. This book is raw, rough, and in your face. Back when I first read it, I described it as being evocative of taking a deep breath in a cigarette smoky room as sounding like a guttural growl at the back of your throat and feeling like crying into your beer. I stand by those statements, but I should also say that this book is sticky like Velcro because it has been stuck in my brain since the moment I finished it. My third favorite book of 2017 is If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. This is a chilling atmospheric campus novel reminiscent of The Secret History by Donna Tartt, but following a group of students studying Shakespeare. Unsurprisingly, a crime is committed that really shakes these kids up and fault lines begin to show between their friendships and also in their connections to reality. This is not an opinion I expect to share with many people, but I actually preferred this book to The Secret History. The pacing, the heavy use of Shakespeare quotations, and the strong character development added so much to an already solid story. I was in somewhat of a stupor for several days after finishing this book, if that gives you any kind of an idea of how immersed I felt in this story. So that leads me into my top two books of the year. I will say that I had a little bit of trouble picking my top book of the year because the following two books both spoke to me on a very deep personal level. But in the end, I had to go with my gut. So my second favorite book of the year is Margaret the First by Danielle Dutton. This is a piece of historical fiction that imagines the life and thoughts of the real 17th century writer Margaret Cavendish, who was the first woman in Britain who wrote to publish. Margaret was known as an eccentric, not just because she was writing with the intention to publish books, which was rather atypical for women at her time, but it was also the way she dressed. It was also her behavior, her mannerisms. All of the above earned her the title of Mad Madge. In this book, Danielle Dutton attempts to get inside Margaret's head, and she hopes to show the sometimes conflicting nature that her personality could have. She often wanted to be secluded and separate from people, but she also desired fame. Dutton makes Margaret shine in this novel, but she also makes her so real and tangible to the point where a scene can happen and you, the reader, can feel what Margaret must be feeling about it because you've come to know her so well without Danielle Dutton having to write a word about it. I connected to this book on a very deep personal level, and not just because Danielle Dutton's writing is exquisite, because it is, but also because I found a lot of myself in this book. In fact, I connected to it so much that I very spontaneously decided to get a snippet of this book tattooed on myself in early spring. I made a whole video about that tattoo and the experience of getting it, and I will link it down below if you would like to watch. And that means that my very favorite book of the year is 
Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. I had heard wonderful things about this book, but in no way did I expect to love this book in the deep way that I ended up loving it. The basic plot of this book is that a widowed country doctor decides to remarry so as to provide his teenage daughter, Molly, with a female figure in her life as she approaches marriageable age. The new wife he selects is a widow herself and has a daughter, Cynthia, who is close to Molly's age. We then get the story of their blended family, the relationships between everyone in their new household, as well as their relationships with people living in the town. Not only is Gaskell's writing spectacular, but the characters felt so intensely real to me that I began to grow to love them and grow frustrated with them as though they were my own family. The friendship that grows between Molly and Cynthia is one of the most beautiful relationships I've ever seen in fiction. And Molly's character is literally everything good in the world personified. So really, there was no choosing. Wives and Daughters absolutely had to be my top book of the year, and I feel very comfortable in saying that it is now my all-time favorite classic. So those were my favorite fiction books of 2017. I would love to hear from you in the comment section below if you've read any of these books, if you've heard about them, or if you would now like to read them now that you've heard me talk about them. Or if you'd like to chat with me elsewhere, I am on a variety of different places on social media, and links to all of my profiles are linked in the description box below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in 2018. Bye.